So <coughs> surveillance in the context of this talk is actually something that is, it's sort of a, a big, big, big field, let's say. But I want to talk specifically about how it is used for social and economic control and enforcement of power structures. But I think the most important thing is the idea that surveillance is used for identification. And it might be identification of a particular piece of content or it might be identification of a person. And this idea of linkability is this idea that if you do a thing, it is linked to all the other things that you have done. This is the purpose of this so-called lawful intercept. Anyone here ever heard of a wiretap order? Right? Raise your hand, seriously, if you have. Okay. Who here thinks they've ever been wiretapped? Of course you would raise your hand. <laughs> this is the woman that made the documentary about Daniel Ellsberg, the guy that ended the Vietnam War. So, of course, she's been wiretapped. Um, but probably, actually, in reality, how many of you live in California full time? So that's probably closer to the number of people that should have raised their hand last time. And we'll talk about why. But um, one of the interesting things about lawful interception is that it is not transparent because it's spy tradecraft. So people generally, when they're involved in this spy tradecraft, like to pretend their systems are perfect. And they like to pretend that, well, not only are their systems perfect, that it is impossible for you to know about any imperfection because it would pose a risk. So this is great news for them because they have a perfect security system, which if any of you here are computer science students, you know that that's totally bogus. And there's no such thing as a perfect system. As it just so happens, um, probably the greatest example against so-called lawful interception is the Vodafone affair of 2005, where some people broke into the main Vodafone switches and actually used the lawful <coughs> intercept systems themselves to spy on members of parliament and I believe the prime minister. They did it by writing a custom backdoor that exploited the lawful intercept systems, specifically I think it was called the Axe, which is a device which is used for uh, ensuring that the lawful intercept orders are being fulfilled. And um, it actually resulted in someone who worked in the phone company being found suicided, and they never found who did any of it. So the people that are actually running this infrastructure are also at risk, in addition to the infrastructure itself posing a risk to society at large. An interesting problem with this also is that the cell phones in Greece were the cell phones used by government officials to do business with other heads of state. So even though it's local phones talking to other local phones, and sometimes local phones talking internationally, all of the people that touch those people, instead of being secure in their ability to do business legitimately to be able to do their government duties, they're wiretapped by unknown parties. And um, yeah, <coughs> since most wiretapping that exists exists in this veil of secrecy, it just so happens that things, uh, things like this, when they're implemented, you don't get to know when a wiretap is being activated, in some cases, if you run the infrastructure. So imagine that you run a piece of network equipment. You're not allowed to know that someone is actually exporting data or is exporting some kind of information about you. So <coughs> I wanted to um, start with the Godwin's Law <coughs> early just to make sure that I, that I was, <coughs> was able to just get this out here. Um, I'm going to read from IBM and the Holocaust by Edwin Black. And I want to um, open this by saying this is a really fantastic book. All of the issues that I'm discussing today, humanity has dealt with time and time again. But specifically, humanity has dealt with the human rights issues relating to technology. And so uh, IBM had, in Germany, a subsidiary called Die Homag. Um, this was essentially a full IBM company in Germany. But they didn't identify as IBM Germany. They were just a subsidiary on paper. So <clears throat> this book, I think probably if you can get through it without crying, you're not. You're not like me, that's for sure. But uh, <coughs> I'll try. None of the publicly voiced statements of Hitler's scientific soldiers ever dissuaded Duhomag or IBM New York from withdrawing from their collaboration with the Reich. By necessity, that collaboration was intense, indispensable, and continuous. Indeed, the IBM method was to first anticipate the needs of government agencies and only then design proprietary data solutions, train official staff, and even implement the programs as a subcontractor when called upon. IBM machines were useless in crates. Tabulators and punch cards were not delivered ready to use like typewriters, adding machines, or even machine guns. Each Holleratz system, that's Dihomag, had to be custom designed by Dihomag engineers. Systems to inventory spare aircraft parts for the Luftwaffe to, to engineer the Reichsbahn railroad schedules and register the Jews with the population for the Reich statistical office were each designed by Dihomag engineers to be completely different from each other. 
And of course, the holes could not be punched just anywhere. Each card had to be custom designed with data fields and columns precisely designed for the card readers. Reich employees had to be trained to use the cards. Duhomeig needed to understand the most intimate details of the intended use, design the cards, and then create the codes. Because of the almost limitless need for tabulators in Hitler's race and geopolitical wars, IBM New York reacted enthusiastically to the prospects of Nazism. While other fearful and reviled American businessmen were curtailing or canceling their dealings with Germany, Watson, who was the director of IBM at the time, embarked upon a historic expansion of DeHomag. Just weeks after Hitler came to power, IBM New York invested more than 7 million Reichsmarks, that's in excess of a million dollars, to dramatically expand the German subsidiary's ability to manufacture machines. So if you read the rest of this book, you'll see that all throughout it, what IBM did was they understood that there was a genocide that was taking place. They understood the political context that were taking place. And they said, we've got a solution for that. There's an app for that. <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's pretty incredible to read this. But I, I suspect the thing that would be most incredible is to read the citations, because it's actually a scholarly work. And this is something that IBM stonewalled from becoming public for basically the entire 20th century, and including the first edition of that book. So I really recommend reading that. And with that as the context, I want to talk about what's happening now. So in 2010, the Iranian police chief uh, basically stated that identification was a key part of their campaign in, let's say, cleansing the internet, if you will. He says, these people should know where they are sending the SMS and email, as these systems are under control. What he's referring to is the infrastructure. When you have a cell phone, you talk to someone else's equipment, right? You just carry the cell part of that, but the rest of the network, the actual cell that you exist inside of, they control it in Iran as well as, well, here. So they should not think using proxies will prevent their identification. If they continue, those who organize or issue appeals have committed a crime worse than those who take to the street. Right? So that's modern day, right? So that's that's pretty that's a pretty scary thing that they're that they're looking at. So what they're trying to do is to use that identification to essentially be able to look at content on the internet, to look at communications, to look at social <coughs> networks, to be able to say these people are promoting democracy, which is against the wishes of our government. We want to crush that. So they do that in a couple of ways. Sometimes they show up at people's houses, sometimes they don't show up at people's houses and they just watch. But generally, they also engage in widespread, countrywide, in fact, censorship. So they block access to sites, or they tamper with things when people download them. There's all kinds of crazy different kinds of, uh, of techniques that they use, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But at its core, in a technical sense, censorship is basically this idea of you, you, you create a distinguisher of some kind. It might be the word Falun Gong, it could be the word democracy, it could be NSA wiretapping. Right? So they create a distinguisher, and then they basically create policies. Normally, public policy is something that we get to vote on or we have some discussion about. Um, well, as it happens, um, we don't even get to know that these machines exist, generally speaking. We know they exist because they interfere with our lives, or they interfere with the Iranian lives. Um, in the case of BART recently, they decided in order to stop a protest, they would just shut off all the cell phone networks, including privately controlled property, which is you know, an interesting problem there because on the one hand, there was the potential that people would come and have a protest. So maybe that was good that they stopped them from that, because something bad could have come from that. Uh, well, I don't know. Prior restraints generally something we reject in the United States. So I mean, we can have that debate, but it's pretty clear that they broke the law in doing that. But that kind of censorship exists on a completely regular basis in lots of places in the world. And we're about to step into that in the United States. So you also see this with blocking of, of really popular sites. I guess some of you have probably used Twitter. Here, raise your hand if you have, maybe. Yeah, OK, right? So Twitter um, you know, is blocked in tons of places. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because you can tell a lot about the filtering technologies based on how they do these blocks. Um, I think probably it's good to talk about motivations as well as to talk about the actual ways that this is implemented. So the motivation is really to erase history and to try to prevent the creation of alternative realities. That is to say, to, to, to push forward and to make something new. Right? It's a, a sort of stabilization issue in some, in some countries. But basically, this notion of erasing history is something we have also dealt with in the past. Right? So censorship at its core is about taking facts that are objectively real and saying, these facts, they don't exist. We're going to block them out for various reasons. Usually, they, you know, they revolve around this, some kind of concept of a nanny state. Like, you don't get to know about this because it would harm the national good. Now, in theory, if it's a democracy, 
that shouldn't actually be an issue because you get to decide what the national good is. But, but it isn't actually the case that we always get that choice. And part of the reason is because we don't have anonymity. We have the ability to be targeted in all the things that we do. So basically, in any communication that we have, raise your hand if you sent a text message this morning. Who here pays their cell phone with a credit card? How hard do you think that it would be? I mean, maybe just someone in the audience could answer here, but how hard would it be to trace all of the things that you do, all of your activities, from one activity to the other? Does anyone want to take a, a shot at this? Pretty easy? OK. Well, part of that actually stems from the fact that the activities that you undertake are bound to an identifier of some kind. We all have different identities on a regular basis, I think, right? When you ride the bus, you don't necessarily identify yourself with a California state ID. It is also the case that when you buy a cell phone, you may identify with that, but your friends who call you might use a different identifier. Like I am often called Jake instead of Jacob. It's not my legal name. We have these different, these different pseudonyms, if we will. Those are all linkable, usually because of behavior and payment methods. And it turns out that one of the kinds of censorship that is most likely to occur for most of us in our lives is actually just the restriction of access entirely full scale blocking, right? Equal rights, equal access mean nothing if the roads that we wish to use to go to places are all blocked off for us specifically. And that happens. This is the net neutrality debate. And in fact, a big part of that is that people can distinguish different types of communication that we have, whether it's downloading from YouTube, which arguably you could say is something trivial. But in Syria right now, using YouTube is pretty serious. They send death squads to people's houses for uploading videos on YouTube. So having anonymity and having it as a strong default is something that allows us to change the answer to that previous question. So we can say, hey, actually, it's really hard to know. So like I have a collection of anonymous SIM cards in my backpack, right? Or I have uh, you know, cash, which is not perfectly anonymous because they have serial numbers, and they actually are tracked by ATM, ATMs and banks. But it's important to also talk about privilege. So one of the privileges that we afford today is the ability for me to ask this question. How many people here identify as being an atheist? That's amazing. OK, so this book is um, amazing. It talked about the transmutation of, of things that exist in society. So all planets, uh, solar systems, life in the universe, essentially. And it was published 14 years before Darwin's Origin of the Species. And it was published anonymously. And after his death, uh, he, he, went to great, he went to great depths to ensure that no one would know who he was. He hid his handwriting because he was a famous writer. He used a, essentially a remailer in that he had people that he could correspond with. And uh, this agent would act as a, an anonymizer for him to some degree. And so he wrote this in, you know, in an era in which talking about that was pretty, pretty serious, right? This was before Darwin actually shocked the world. I mean, the Victorian society that, that received it, of course, took it in a very polite fashion, as most Victorian society uh, events seem to happen. Uh, but the thing is that he had to stay anonymous because he did not have the privilege to talk about what he observed. And this is really important because we also don't have the privilege to talk about many things that we observe as well. And in this particular case, his anonymity worked out because he used a bunch of trusted people in his vicinity to help him with this. So it was useful. This kind of mutual aid allowed him to publish this book and for the ideas to get out. And supposedly, it even inspired Charles Darwin in his authorship of Origin of the Species, if you believe the Wikipedia. <laughs> Some classic examples of this in America. I mean, I generally try to make a global, uh, a global discussion because I actually think that nationalism is a sickness. But it just so happens that the American Revolution was largely, uh, in, in some ways, I believe, a success due to the fact that we were able to conduct a kind of guerrilla <coughs> warfare against the British. And specifically, when a printer would print a thing and put their mark on it, it was possible for the king to send people to shut down that printer. But when pamphleteers printed up grievances, when they printed up uh, actions that people should take and talked about specific things that were taking place, now granted, if it was a lie, it was worth about what the paper was written on and, and nothing more. But in the case that it was true, the king could not strike back. And that was extremely powerful because it was part of guerrilla warfare. It was part of the asymmetry of power that allowed people, as the Quakers would say, to speak truth to power. But it was also about speaking truth to people who didn't even realize that they had power, didn't even realize that they could have agency to be able to try to resist the monarchy. 
And that's really important. I mean, for me, I think that's one of the most canonical examples. But the better example that is more modern is the COINTELPRO program. Anyone here ever have a run-in with the FBI as an anti-war activist in the 60s? I see a bunch of old gray beards here. Got one in the back, two in the back, yeah. You look very respectable now. Um, <laughs> the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI broke into the FBI office, I believe it was in Pennsylvania, and they leaked a bunch of documents that showed systemic corruption in the US government going back basically to the 1910s and 1920s. And it led to the creation of the Church Committee, which is part of what also created the FISA courts. So in theory, this is where they are going to violate your civil liberties. They tried to add some checks and balances because they understood centralization, centralization of power created serious problems, especially for accountability with, with regard to secrecy and national security. So it's interesting because in both cases, these are like extremely illegal activities, but they were about redressing a serious injustice that existed. In this case, it was fighting against the monarchy, which I think is, you know, I think most of us would agree, although that's an argument uh, that maybe doesn't resonate well with scientists, but I think it's clear that we are better off without a monarchy and that democracy is a superior way to live. And I think that it is important that we get to express ourselves, to be able to, to actually say, this is what we want to see in the world and not, not have the will of one man put us down, which isn't, you know, it's a very, uh, it's interesting to live, you know, and think that uh, there was a time in which patriarchy was so literal that, that it was actually a king in another country that was that. So it's nice to know that there, in the 20th century, people were still undertaking these types of activities, even though it was subversive, even though it was clearly illegal to break into the FBI's office. It was also clearly illegal for the FBI to put informants in people's lives, to have them sabotage marriages, to have them destroy property, to have them steal things, to have become agent provocateurs, all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, it was just incredibly scary. And the thing that's really scary is that we need another one of these, right? Because in the 21st century, that is exactly the thing. And I'm not saying you should go out and break into the FBI's offices, but I think you should go out and join the FBI. <laughs> so you don't have to break into their offices. Because 99% of the police make the rest of them look bad. And you can be the 1% that actually matters for the people, for the rest of the people. So it's a thought, just a thought. <laughs> And some people in the audience, I think, this is the point in which I can actually hear the bells ringing about how people don't have anything to hide. And I think that's fantastic that you have that privilege. And I wish that I could share that with you, but I can't. Uh, part of it is because I can't stop talking about this stuff. And another part of it is because it turns out that most people that engage in incredibly illegal or immoral behavior produce reams of documentation about their crimes and about the illegal things that they are doing and about the planning and the, uh, you know, you don't need to make up conspiracies, right? The documentation proves that there are agreements. It's not a conspiracy, it's a deal. Usually a business deal, in fact. There's a wonderful scientist by the name of Kelly Kane and she actually studies surveillance. She might actually be the only person in the United States that I know of that's a social scientist that studies surveillance. She's at uh, the University of Indiana. Um, she basically talks about things like misclosures, that is accidental disclosures of data, and also talks about surveillance and how people react to surveillance. So a big part of it is that people like to say that it won't happen to them, right? Who here thinks that none of this surveillance stuff will happen to them, right? It's good for you to shill for me, I appreciate that. Um, right? And, and, and the, the main core of this, and the reason that people believe this, is because they just don't think that they're special in the light of all the things that are happening in the world. But the crazy thing about the way that surveillance happens now is that everybody gets surveilled by default to different degrees, and then later, when you do something that attracts some attention, they go back and look through all the data they've collected to try to, fi to, try to find that stuff. And of course, if you ever hear someone saying that they, don't, uh, that they don't care about privacy, I would ask you to look and see if they're wearing clothes, for one. <laughs> and if they have curtains on their windows, passwords on their computer systems, if they lock their car. I mean, the key is not that you don't have some desire to, to have um, some degree of privacy. The key is to understand that you have, essentially at its core, you have the desire to have agency in your life. You might be willing to make compromises for law enforcement because there are some times 
You know, let's say there was a homicide and the police come and ask you for help. It might be so reasonable if you're a witness that you would say, yeah, I want to help with that. And it's good for them to have some powers for investigation, for sure. There's no question about that. But it is not good if, because there's a homicide, they decide to kick down your door and take all of your things. The Fourth Amendment is very, very specific about this. You need to have probable cause. You need to actually be able to show that there is something happening there. Um, that seems to largely be disappearing these days. Uh, I can't personally talk about the legal situation that I'm in very much for various reasons, but I can tell you that I, my interpretation of the Fourth Amendment is significantly different than the Department of Justice and the federal government. And the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, the Department of Homeland Security, Immigration, Customs Enforcement, the U.S. Navy, the Air Force of Office of Special Investigation. You know, the list goes on. So, because <clears throat> there's a lot of it. That, that to me, I think is important because the data you leave behind, it tells a story about you, which is not necessarily true. Data retention is the enemy of being able to change your mind, being able to have thought something other than what the narrative someone else has constructed is telling. Because it turns out that when someone else tells a story and they have a bunch of facts, the story can sound completely reasonable. But it might be that those facts tell a completely different story. And it could be that the story is completely incorrect, even though it is totally made up of facts. Usually people that operate surveillance equipment, they don't think that the machines themselves can ever make mistakes, which is crazy, right? All of the machines that we have make mistakes all of the time. And it is certainly the case with surveillance equipment that because it is in secrecy and it receives less scrutiny, it has bugs. <coughs> and let me tell you, there are some fun bugs in surveillance equipment. So if we want to talk about how it's done, I understood that this was going to be mostly technical people. So I, I want to take a quick survey to make sure that I'm not about to make half the people fall asleep, because I see some, some of those anti-war activists are dropping off. So <laughs> I'm with you in solidarity, so I want to make it interesting. Uh, who here knows how to program their home computer to beam themselves into the future? <laughs> Anyone? A couple people? Anybody here? Computer science? Here? <laughs> it was a craft work reference. I apologize. Um, they're a great influence. So, but seriously, who here studies something technical, some kind of engineering or science? Wow, that's amazing. That's like half of America. So, uh, in terms of the total students studying that, so. Um, China does a spider web approach for censorship. So they have a guy or a series of guys that decide some policies, and then they sort of have a trickle down effect where they say, well, we have this edge firewall, and then we want companies outside um, of the edge on either side to do certain kinds of censorship. And they usually, as I understand it, say something like, don't embarrass us. And that's, that's what they, they, they sort of push down. So that means don't embarrass us is very liberally interpreted as I better not embarrass these people that would be very bad for me. So their censorship really varies. Most of the really good censorship technology that they have and that they use is provided by Cisco. And some of their sales team members actually had in slides suppress dissidents, right? Or I believe the exact phrase they talked about was about uh, Falun Gong as an undesirable element of society that they could identify and weed out. And those, those slides are public. So just that, like, if you think about that, and then you think about IBM and the Holocaust by, by Mr. Black here, you can see some parallels that are sort of ominous. And it's interesting, because on the one hand, Cisco helps enable China to connect to the internet. And on the other hand, they know damn well what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that is really important, because it means that they're complicit. And that, that is something that, over time, I think, we will learn more and more about this. For example, the United States censorship usually is with legal threats or illegal tactics that they try to argue later are legal. Like in the cases that I'm not going to talk about with myself, they just decided that the Constitution is interpreted totally differently. And we have to fight it. And of course, you know, that's what's happening is we're fighting it. But legal threats are significantly different than this kind of corruption influence, except in the case of, say, uh, what was it, Lieberman calling Amazon, telling him not to host WikiLeaks? Mm -hmm. OK, so maybe it's not so different than China at all in some cases. <laughs> but I think it's important to note that we at least pretend that the rule of law is important here. And we'll talk a little bit about the NSA AT and treason issue in a second. Lebanon likes to use free software, which is interesting. Um, they also allow you to just turn off the censorship. So you can say, like, I would like to opt in to censoring my internet connection. 
So they offer it as a service. Censorship as a service. <laughs> you know? Um, Syria largely uses uh, off-the-shelf commercial products, and we're going to talk extensively about Syria for about four minutes and 30 seconds. Everybody does it differently, but at the core of it, it's about identification and classification all the time, both of the traffic and of the people. Right? So this is a picture, which is fantastic. Uh, it's Burma, and uh, it's probably too hard to read the bottom. It says, Fortinet introduces its products in Burma in May 2004. Uh, Fortinet's uh, uh, main sales guy, I can't pronounce any of these names, meets the general from the military junta. This is fantastic because just a couple weeks earlier, the Fortinet had said they absolutely did not sell equipment to a repressive regime like Burma. That would just never happen. And so some people posted these television, state television screenshots, and then they said, OK, oh, gosh. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, well, uh, OK. So now all the Burma equipment, largely from Fortinet, they, they felt some public pressure, so they changed. They've been replaced with Cisco devices and Blue Code devices. In Iran, I'm sorry to show this picture. It's pretty disturbing. This is a woman by the name of Netta. She was shot in the heart by the besieged militia. How many of you have seen that, the video or the picture? Right? All right. So this, I think, is, is horrible. And this is an example of a legitimate trickle-down effect, right? We can argue about economic trickle-down effects. Surveillance trickle-down effects are not really something we need to argue about. Nokia built and stated that they built their lawful intercept solutions because they are required by CALEA, that's the law enforcement lawful intercept laws in the United States, they had to build them in. So when they gave them to the Iranians, they had to come with the American surveillance infrastructure built in as a feature, or they wouldn't buy it. So America, with our lack of um, foresight, actually, in some ways, created a market where it was a necessity for Nokia to compete with these features. And these features are used to oppress people. And that type of oppression is very specific in her case. She got shot in the heart, and she died. Right? And there's a, there's a very clear chain between these things. There are activists in Iran that, on a regular basis, when they don't use circumvention technologies and anonymity technologies, the intelligence services slide their emails, their SMSs, they slide them across the desk and say, we know you're guilty, we're going to torture you until you tell us more. And then they do. How do they get that information? They get it by watching, by observing, by attacking. And they do it with Western technologies. And it's indisputable, and Nokia tries to say that it's OK because we do it here. And that's a really compelling argument, which means that we're also wrong here, not that they are justified there. Saudi is, uh, you, if you want, I can, I'm happy to give any students, I mean, I know that some of you are probably not particularly interested in doing this, but if you are interested in directly connecting to any of these filters to play with them, I would highly encourage you to explore them. I will give you access to all of the information I have about all these filters if you contact me and your undergrad or graduate student. Totally happy to help you so you can see this, in this case, um, this is Saudi, you can see it says Tor Disabled in the corner. Um, I had access to a computer system inside of a Saudi uh, network where a friend of mine gave me SSH access, and so I just set up like a reverse SSH tunnel, and then I just you know tried to browse the web. I think I went to a small industrial film company that I tried to that I worked for at the time, and I, and I saw that it, that it was blocked. They actually are pretty transparent in that they tell people all about their surveillance infrastructure. Qatar has something similar. I mean, it's like a little thumb that sticks out of Saudi. And, and you can actually fingerprint. This I was trying to go to Tor, the Tor project website. You can actually fingerprint um, the device based on the redirects that are getting inserted. Because it turns out it says protocol equals device. And deep plain language equals URL equals. It turns out they have all these other little pieces of information in there that serve as distinguishers for censorship devices. So you can actually tell who makes these devices. And then you can contact their CEOs. This, uh, I think, was NetSweeper, but it could have been SmartFilter. Um, Saudi, I believe, is SmartFilter. Um, and this is uh, in Bahrain. So in Bahrain, you, you find that uh, basically everything there is completely surveilled. They like to tamper with anything they possibly can. Uh, I've done some trainings for people in the region. and. It's a, it's a pretty bad place. So Blue Coat sells to Bahrain, and because it is not on the embargo list, they say it's fine. But these people torture people, they kill them, they shoot them with live ammunition for walking in the street demanding redress of the concerns that they have about how their society is being run. And because the laws don't actually curtail the corporations that are enabling this behavior, uh, the corporations say, well, the law 
and morality, they're the same thing. Legal and illegal are the same as right and wrong, which I actually don't agree with that. Uh, and I hope that no one in this room does, but I mean, I suppose it's a disappointing world. So um, this, this is a, a primary example. Because of the American interests in the region, we are not willing to condemn these companies when their equipment is being used to kill people. And that is serious, I think, in my opinion. We need to either change the laws or the societal expectations or change the companies. We need to make sure that these companies understand that that's not the right thing. This is what it looks like in Lebanon when you try to visit the Torah Project. Um, it's super easy to circumvent most of this. Jordan is the same. Turkey is the same. Italy uses DNS circumvention. You're noticing a trend here? So I'm starting, and I'm moving from the Gulf, and I'm moving up into Europe. Wait a minute. These are free countries full of white people. What's going on? I don't understand. You can see in the corner, uh, Australian censorship. I was looking up there, you know, seeing about it. Oh, look at that. Ireland, speaking of white people. So <laughs> this is crazy, right? I mean, how can this be happening? This is the free world, right? If you look at all these online internet censorship reports, like from the Open Net Initiative and other places, Report to Sans Frontier and other, and other bodies on the internet, they usually paint the world in this really simplistic light where they say, good people, and then it's all of the West English-speaking countries and some of Europe and the West that doesn't speak English, and then everybody else is a repressive regime. That's retarded. <laughs> it is not so simple. It is absolutely wrong to think of it this way. In the case of intellectual property especially, right? this notion here that intellectual property, first of all, is property, is nonsense. But second of all, they block access to it and say, no, no, there are legitimate things you can do. Legal downloading. You can also visit these other services that ensure to compensate the artists. That seems like a conflict of interest to me because it turns out that they're a part of that, um, that ISP. Denmark does this too. They tried to block the Pirate Bay as well, and they do this through DNS filtering. And I mean, this is just crazy, right? Because many, many, many people in Denmark are actually using these services. None of them are consulted, and then legal decisions are either implemented or not legal decisions. Voluntary filtering, in the case of Canada, for example, it's enacted, and you have no say in it. And it's only the case that if you happen to trip across it, you might notice that it is happening at all, which is, you know, that's uh, concerning, I think. You know, in the United States, as my friend Leaf here points out, um, surveillance is being used for very specific kinds of exploitation. In this case, it's about uh, lassoing you into profit. So for example, who here has Comcast at their house? <coughs> who here always uses some kind of encrypted proxy or VPN or Tor? Raise your hand if you do. That's fuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you know that saying, if you're not paying for something, you're the product? That's well, right. you're paying for it, and you're the product <laughs> in this case. So unfortunately, that saying needs to be updated. In the USA, Comcast, Rogers, Verizon. Verizon is actually very good. Who, who here had Verizon once? Or does now? Anybody? All right, check this out. They claimed once, as Leif astutely pointed out, that um, the market and people would shame companies into ensuring that they would never do this kind of harvesting. And now they openly perform it. And if you go digging along on their website, you might be able to opt out of it on a line-by-line -line basis. Great. So um, <clears throat> that's kind of a disaster, especially because they promise to anonymize this data before they sell it. That's a really hard problem, to anonymize large data sets. I don't buy that they can do it very well. And it would be awesome if some researchers here, especially ones with a moderate budget, just bought some of this data and just ruined them <laughs> for basically exploiting people and taking advantage of their position in a way that does not have any informed consent at all. And I think that's really important because this, is, this kind of profiteering is very dangerous. It creates a world where they now have incentives not just to control the network, but to change the way that you see the world entirely. Right? They're going to deliver different ads to you, potentially. Um, here's another great example of censorship in America. This is Amtrak. Anybody here ever ride a train? I know it's California, so not a lot of them, but, um, <clears throat> and the ones that are here, whew, 20 hours to get to Seattle or something. So um, they block access to legitimate US companies. This was one where I was trying to visit the company that I worked for, and they blocked access to it. This is interesting because Amtrak takes US government money, and then they censor access to US company websites selectively. They say stuff like, well, you know, it's high bandwidth. OK, sure, I understand. They're, they're, they're trying to deal with the high bandwidth. I understand that running a train is not anything like getting an extra uplink or 10. 
and that it is a serious engineering effort that would require what? It's, it makes no sense, right? It makes no sense, especially because they take government money. If they were completely private, that kind of corporate censorship, well, I'm certainly not a favor of it. Well, luckily for us, there would be some kind of alternative, right? Supposedly in the free market, there are alternatives. In this case, this is a, a government-sponsored business that has essentially a monopoly on rail transportation in large parts of the country, and they get to choose what sites are up or down with pretty much no transparency at all. Via Rail in Canada is the same. I asked them for a list of all the sites they censored. They refused to send it to me, so I extracted it from their filter. <laughs> <laughs> right? Freedom of information, right? <clears throat> you want it, you got to go get it. The United States has something similar, right? So they just decide arbitrarily that they have the right. This is the Immigration Customs Enforcement Homeland Security to protect the fatherland. Or, I mean, <laughs> to, yeah, that slips out sometimes. Um, they just decided one day to just seize a bunch of domains. This includes rojadirect.org. Roja this is not a site selling Gucci handbag knockoffs. This is a political site that they decided to censor. This is not like, in the future, America will censor sites. This is like, right now, this is the site. This is the picture you will see if you go to that website. And you'll see that, you'll, you'll see that picture because they have arbitrarily asserted that and the companies that are protecting this, this so-called property online, which is really actually about pamphleteering. A website is like a pamphlet. Right? And, and, for, and for them to just take this, and then you have to ask the government for redress, you have to say, I want you to not take that. Well, it turns out that that doesn't, uh, that doesn't go over very well. And, and it also turns out it isn't very effective. So there's a, a plugin for Firefox called Mafia Fire, which you install, and it just makes it so when you browse to the sites, it doesn't use the name system, the DNS system at all, and uh, it just circumvents it. So there's no possible way that I'm going to get through everything I had here because I was hoping to have another 20 minutes. So unless we occupy this classroom, which I'm totally in favor of, um, we probably will not be able to go through it all. But I just wanted to show real quick uh, something that's near and dear to my heart and is also extremely upsetting. I, vo I voted for Obama, which I'm very regretful about now, um, but specifically because of this billboard and what it represents, which is AT&T in San Francisco. And why is it depressing to me? It's depressing to me because, as Jeremy Bentham pointed out with his construction of the Panopticon in 1785, um, if it was possible for everyone to feel like they would watch, they would be their own prisoners, they would be their own guards, and they would fuse them together into one, right? So they would be their own policemen. So what we did is we created a centralized system, and we called it, well, the telephone network. And we've expanded that to the internet. And AT&T largely routes all of the internet companies that intertwine. So even if you use a good ISP like Sonic.net, which is a great ISP, if they've got to connect to the greater internet, they probably traverse AT&T. So we went from this, and we ended up with that. Whether or not we did it consciously is sort of irrelevant because it is where we are. And this is an example of the special uh, study group three, which is, it sounds like a very benign thing, but this is actually the splitter that was used by the NSA at Second and Folsom. And this, this splitter here took the internet traffic from AT&T's backbones in all the places where all the internet companies connect and secretly exported the traffic to the NSA, which generally sounds like a general warrant to me because they're exporting tons and tons of traffic. And uh, they're doing it without any discrimination at all to ensure that they're only getting bad guys, only getting terrorists or something like that. And that is, I think, really, really bad news. But luckily, we have courts and laws that will write this. Everybody knows this story, though, right? Who here knows the an what happens in this? Anybody that isn't a journalist? Nobody else? Anyone want to take a guess? What do you think? Did the NSA work probably, out? It was probably all pretty quiet afterwards. I didn't see more of it, but I remember reading about it. Well, some people in San Francisco and around the world, they took notice of this. I especially like this uh, Stephen Colbert feature, the word of the day, AT and treason. Um, this is the room that was actually there. Um, we can go back to that for a second. This is the room where they did that. And, you know, just coincidentally, outside of my office, I noticed this one day, which I thought was pretty cool. It turns out the Billboard Liberation Front had actually liberated the billboard. <laughs> <laughs> in their very first political art statement ever in terms of government political stuff, um, which I thought was interesting. So there's that room again, 641A. And this is where that study group three took place. Uh, so what's the difference here between this kind of stuff? General warrants are part of the reason we shot the British. This part of the reason I elected Obama was to stop that. And I think a lot of us probably voted for him thinking that he would curtail some of the government excess. And he has failed to do so in some pretty big ways. And it's quite depressing. So I'm going to argue that I showed you all of these countries. And I, I was trying to go from the Middle East, where everybody knows it's just kind of a bad place, 
making it all the way across the ocean. And I think it's important to note that it is actually different here. So when I asked, you know, who here has ever been surveilled, whether or not you know it, you should have risen. You, you should have probably actually stood up and said something along the lines of, I have and I'm furious about it because I have no redress. In fact, the government argued that you have no right to seek any kind of redress because everybody was harmed. <laughs> That's unbelievable, right? Everybody was harmed. Well, so how did they do it? They did it with Naris. Uh, this picture, I think, uh, is probably public. Um, this guy here, who cares? The guy's an asshole anyway. <laughs> this, guy, this guy here um, was on vacation in Egypt. From what we know, Naris actually sold the same wiretapping, the Naris Insight devices, to the NSA. They also sold them to Telecom Egypt, right? So who, who's making this happen? Well, it's Naris. And Naris actually looks at it. And, and is able to extract all kinds of information. And who do they partner with? IBM. Fantastic. I mean, it's, I, mean I think the parallels and the connections there, they, you know, they're 80 years of business. You know, they have a lot of experience th about classifying human beings and understanding what's going on there. And it really ties together. And Norris wants to make sure to leverage that knowledge in order to better surveil Mubarak's dictatorship in Egypt. This is, this is six years ago when that picture was taken, according to the exit information that I pulled out of the image, right? And it's amazing the way he says anything that comes through the network when we can record and we can reconstruct it. And this is actually this is public stuff where he was bragging to Wired, which is pretty fantastic. Syria, same deal, only it's significantly worse. I've actually had people that have contacted me that have worked on the infrastructure there and they have leaked information to me about it. And uh, never heard from those people again, so I don't know how well that went, which is pretty pretty scary stuff, right? People talking about being disappeared, people being told that their you know, family will be harmed if they, if they don't do particular work, tracking people down. And who helps them? But Bluecoat. Bluecoat builds the filters, builds, uh, builds new rules. So some engineer in California figures out how to block a new protocol for getting information out, and then they push out an update, and even in an embargoed country like Syria, they somehow get those updates. So it's a force magnification where they custom design, if we remember this, this reading here, they custom design things to meet the needs of their customers and then they ship them over, proprietary data solutions shipped over, and then they use it to identify people. And in the case of Blue Code in Syria, death squads go to people's houses and they kill them for things as stupid as Facebook posts. And I say stupid in the sense that it should be trivial, but that's actually just my privilege, right? If I post on Facebook, I just get recorded by the NSA. No harm comes to me directly and immediately. Whereas there, it's actually a matter of life and death. So some people broke into the uh, Bluecoat um, log server, which was apparently not very hard because it was just an anonymous FTP server. And it uh, turns out that the login was anonymous. <laughs> right? yeah. I think technically that's not even breaking and entering. I think that's more like uh, leveraging existing business knowledge about the FTP protocol. <laughs> Maybe. Right? And this is a classification of the URLs and observations that are made. And Bluecoat makes some really fantastic statements like, oh, we don't, they don't phone home. Total bullshit, complete lies. That's the URL I extracted from some of their firmware. And in fact, it posts the serial number. And, uh, and this one is actually where they have the serial number and they collect it and they say, oh, yeah, 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 you're, uh, you're a valid Bluecoat device. You're good for <coughs> updates. Um, and that's, I think, uh, that's a pretty serious problem. And um, unfortunately, this kind of technological stuff is just, just the tip of the iceberg in some of these countries. And in the United States, if we could return to that, since we're talking about American companies, these are the guys that are going to be censoring our internet soon. They already do it for most American government buildings that you will visit, and in often cases universities, in fact. If you have access to some of these devices and you'd like to provide me with software updates and filter information, I would love to talk to you later. Um, these guys are building the stuff. So when they start to get installed by force at places like Sonic.net and AT&T, I mean, AT&T is not going to fight it. Sonic might, but that doesn't mean they'll win. Um, these guys are, are going to be pretty bad news. So remote exploits in these devices will be very valuable for freedom later, which is a pretty crazy idea to think about it. I mean, it's a sort of cypherpunk nightmare. Um, and part of how this is going to happen is through the law. So anybody here heard of the e-parasite or Stop Online Pri Piracy Act? Uh, or, yeah. This is great. This actually get to not preach to the choir for a second. All right. Basically, the idea is the government wants to be able to take things offline, cut off funding, to be able to block access, and to get DNS servers to lie to you, to basically be able to say to you that uh, you know that this doesn't exist. Now, this is like exactly like this censorship that's happening in Denmark and the censorship that's happening in China, and they want to be able to force private companies to do that and to be able to force anyone there. 
Unfortunately, with DNSSEC, the whole idea is to stop that kind of stuff from happening anywhere, to stop objective reality from being tampered with by tin pot dictatorships, or in our case, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but bigger, much bigger than a tin pot. So um, this is really scary stuff. And um, lots of people recently um, from you know, small groups like NoiseBridge and the Tor Project where I work to Mozilla and Google and just tons and tons of, of people that actually understand how the technology works, they really want people to stop it. I really recommend calling to try to stop it because basically what it is is certifying lies. The government wants to be able to take this down for business interests, but it isn't in our business interests and it is in our societal interests to have that occur. And unfortunately, if this passes, I think it will be the time in which lots of hosting and lots of systems will actually have to go to other countries. Because the law, which used to be very strong, where the freedom of speech was at least in theory, no prior restraint was required, it's going to change things. Single infringements on a page, like if someone uploaded something to Facebook, of course, they'll get special treatment because they're an Alexa top you know, 10 site or something like this. But a single piece of information posted to Facebook is enough to take the entire site offline with the way that the bill is written today. So just think about that for a second. When the police try to censor videos of, say, Occupy Wall Street of a police officer doing something, they can claim infringement and YouTube's supposed to go down. That's crazy, and it's censorship without any question. They tried to remove blacklist and censorship from the bill as much as possible, but it's certainly not the case. My friend Zuko, who's a really fantastic cypherpunk who writes all kinds of crypto solutions, he says, I want humanity to invent an internet that doesn't rely on the consent of any government, so we should vote yes on SOPA. Which is an interesting alternative view, and in a sense, if we head in that direction, I'm going to be working with Zuko on that exact problem, and you should all come help. Right? So let's reframe all of this into something that is empowering, because that was so depressing, and I'm sorry about that. But that's the state of the world in uh, the abridged version. Um, I have probably like 150 other examples. So if you want to know more, you can ask me about it. But really, the key thing is to create privacy by design systems. So like, Sonic can't give up your information if they don't have it in the first place. Twitter can't give up your information if they don't have it in the first place, or if they only keep it for a short period of time. Privacy by policy is where they make promises. Design privacy <coughs> is where, regardless of the promise they make, they have a compartmentalized piece of information, and they can't actually give it up. So when you build a system and you log extensive amounts of data, you actually put your users at risk. And that's especially bad if you're trying to productize your users, especially if it has to do with free speech. So what we need to do is actually create privacy by design systems. We need to make it so that dragnet surveillance, like the NSA warrantless wiretapping, is actually worthless to perform. We have to change the economic incentives there. So that when someone performs click hijacking or click stream farming or however you want to productize the network or to spy on people or to politically persecute them in some way, they just see encrypted traffic. And it doesn't actually identify who is talking to who and what they're saying. Um, but that's, that's really hard because what it comes down to right now in the law is that the government tries to say that metadata is not the same as content. But I promise you that Metadata in aggregate is in fact content, maybe not legally at the moment, although I think that there's a strong case to be made there. Metadata in aggregate tells a story about you, which if you have a cell phone, if you have computers, if you have internet connections registered to you, if you have a car with an RFID or a fast track pass or something like this, all that information correlated will tell where you went, with great probability who you saw and who you talked to, and all the things that you did, even though they don't know for sure, if they've ever had someone watch you one time, or if they've ever looked at any of that stuff, they would be able to tell immediately. And behavioral analysis is scary because it's like a fingerprint. You can't really change the top 10 people you call on a regular basis, even if they all change their phone numbers. It's possible to actually figure out that social group again just by looking at the data. So without protection of that metadata, we really don't have protection of the content because there's a chilling effect. I mean, I can tell you there are a lot of people that don't call me anymore. Uh, don't get invited to Facebook parties either. <laughs> so I mean, I'm okay with that, but you know, there were shitty parties. But the thing is that, like, it's, you know, and who needs friends like that? But in reality, the, the, the problem is that making this distinction between content and metadata is only relevant when the metadata is like a super small part of your life. Like a single point in time might be reasonable, but all points in time tell everything about you and can reveal your location. So I want to recontextualize this a little bit further. Who here knows about the HIV virus? Come on, guys, seriously? <laughs> All right. 
This is the French AIDS campaign, which I thought, you know, I care about free speech, so I thought I would try to put some free speech in here. And uh, this is a great example of, of how we recontextualize what we think is beautiful and wonderful, and how we need to know, and how we have done this, in fact, in the past. So clearly what they're saying is that even though things seem OK, you don't actually know that the person that you're sleeping with does not have the HIV virus. And you need to use protection. You need to protect yourself. We need to recontextualize communication security in a similar way. Right? There are thousands of people in Syria that have been killed because of communications technologies built in insecurity. There are many people who are unjustly in prison. And people will say, well, bad guys are caught too. Good people were also you know, probably in harm's way in many cases where, where they were protected by condoms and bad people too. But society has to make a stand and say, we actually care about not having this be an epidemic, not having this kind of crazy abuse take place. And we did this with HIV. Originally, we didn't, though, because it was just a gay disease. And nobody cares about gay people, right? It was GRID, the gay-related immune deficiency. Now, when it stopped being about marginalized communities, America took a stand. And we started raising millions of dollars. And we started to become aware. And we had a consciousness-raising moment as an entire country. And in fact, the whole world did. We have to see that the power asymmetry that exists with surveillance, which is operated by masters as opposed to the people, that power asymmetry is, is wrong. It doesn't work out in the long run for most people. And so if we think about unencrypted communications, if we think about revealing our social network in the same way that it presents danger, where your responsibility isn't just about whether you care about your privacy, but whether or not your friends do, where you have to check in with them to actually understand their, their, their thoughts, that, that, recon, that recontextualizes it in a way where you can think about power and your own agency. So we can talk about it instead of cyber war as cyber peace building. So imagine if we recreate the whole idea of the internet and we say to ourselves that we want to be free. We want the First Amendment to apply everywhere online. We want to be able to observe what is happening and to be able to talk about it. And that means we want to make sure that the, the, the sort of externalities that stop us from speaking, like when you were observed, you changed your behavior. So the question is, of course, if you had a way to speak that was pretty secure. I mean, maybe the NSA can actually factor primes way better than we understand. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. But I don't think they're going to reveal that capability, generally speaking. And it's certainly not the case that anybody in this room can factor 40, 96-bit primes in any reasonable period of time. So strong crypto actually gives us the possibility to re regain some of that agency and to be able to say, hey, I want to be able to speak freely. So here's an example. You can use Tor to browse the <coughs> web. And when you browse the web using Tor, you actually, you're, you're going to route out through a completely different set of computer systems. Anybody watching your local internet connection, regardless of their data retention policies, they only see you talking to the Tor network. They don't see anything else. That's huge, because it means that there's no longer really an economic incentive to do that kind of logging, at least from a passive perspective. This is off the record messaging. I was talking with a good friend of mine at the EFF, and we were talking. Um, on Jabber, which is, if anybody here used Gchat, that's the Jabber protocol. And we used off-the-record messaging. Google has a feature called off-the-record messaging, which is go off the record. And what that is, is they promise not to log it. But if you're being wiretapped, well, how good is that promise? Now, I don't know if that button is still in my Gmail account. I didn't bother to look. But I'm going to go ahead and say that it probably is still in my Gmail account. And so how good is that promise now, especially with some of the stuff that's been written in the newspapers lately? Not very good. OTR makes that promise something that's end-to-end -end encrypted so that what Google gets is worthless. It's just a bunch of math problems that no one can solve without these secret keys. And at the end of the conversation, even if your computers are stolen from you, the secret keys are actually destroyed as part of the protocol. It's a property called forward secrecy. So yeah, they can record it all. They know who is talking to who, but they don't know what is being said anymore. They know the frequency. That's great. That's huge, right? So I was just saying, I'm concerned about NSA wiretapping, and I feel the courts have failed us. Do you think that using off the record is a clear expression of my desire to have privacy? And she said, if that doesn't demonstrate that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in this conversation, nothing will. Well, ironically, this happened on my Gmail account during a time period, I believe, in which the US government subpoenaed it. Right? So regardless of my expectation of privacy, the government makes arguments saying that you know, I have no expectation of privacy, which is total bullshit. It's a lie. Right? Moxie built this great, who has an Android phone in the room? Anyone? Awesome. Red phone, while not free software, and is kind of a bummer for that reason, allows you to make end-to-end -end encrypted phone calls using only telephone numbers. So you don't need logins and passwords or anything like that. 
This is pretty practical. I use it to talk with journalists all over the world. I try not to talk to journalists that can't install an Android application, <laughs> generally speaking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's another phone application. Who here has an iPhone? Great. Private GSM is a, is a telephone application that is exactly like Redphone, but it's actually built on free software. And it's absolutely something that you can uh, use. And between the two of them, you can actually have real encrypted calls that even if they're recorded, they have the same property as OTR. So if they record it, the data is worthless. Text Secure is off the record messaging, and it occurs with text messages as the transport medium. So you get the same properties of off the record messaging. All of the cell phone networks that are in the United States give up data to the police without a warrant, as a fact. If you look at the recent Department of Justice memo that was just leaked, they actually retain the text messages for way longer than is necessary. In some cases, they're recorded forever. So this property of forward secrecy with text messages, pretty great. Because imagine if it was, hey, you're going to the protest, and then someone goes to the protest, and they get arrested. Oh, were you two conspiring? <laughs> well, the data tells this story about how you guys had planned to go to the protest together, right? Tahoe Least Authoritative File System uh, is, uh, I actually think I said that wrong, Tahoe laughs uh, in the face of cloud, uh, of cloud uh, diversion. And when people use cloud storage, uh, it basically is reduced to just availability. So you encrypt it on the client side, and what's stored in the cloud is just encrypted data. So you don't have to trust that the cloud people haven't tampered. You can verify they haven't tampered. And whatever tampering they do, the best they can do is make your data unavailable. And we're working on a thing called the Tor Router, which you'll plug in in your house. I have it with me in the trunk of a car. Um, I forgot to bring it out. Um, you plug it in. It creates Tor nodes wherever you are. It opens a wireless network wherever you are. If you join the wireless network, all of your traffic is automatically routed over Tor. And it anonymizes your traffic. So you can have an open Wi-Fi network without anyone ever knowing that someone is at your house using that open Wi-Fi by the traffic. It won't trace back to you. It traces back to the Tor network. And since it builds the Tor network as well, it fights against censorship. And it's also like a NAT router. It also has a bunch of other crazy stuff, like you can play music with it if you wanted to replace your proprietary airport device. I'm sorry, I have a class for the exam in two minutes, so I would appreciate if you could finish quickly. Sure, yeah. yeah. So obviously, <laughs> it's time to go, which is good for timing. If anybody has any questions, <coughs> I am happy to talk outside. Yeah, do you have a question? No, no, I'll call you. OK, cool. Thank you so much. It's um here. I forgot I uh the primary character is a, oh, good, good. a colleague oh, of Jake's in Iceland. Okay. But one of the one of the other people who's been subpoenaed. Okay. She's the member of parliament in Iceland. But, but he's become of increasing more interest to me along the way.
I met him in Germany at the Chaos Computer Camp. Oh, you did? Yeah, and he was with the uh, Brigitte and Reykjavik. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, we're having lunch if you want to join us. If you're going to be, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 I think it's time to Jake. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. I thought if you want to have more time, that's the time to do it. Yes, that'd be great. Plus, he's, let's get out of here. Yeah, let's right get out of here before we get in there. Yes. Or you might just hand it. Let's see how it works. I do want to try and check the sound and see if we can solve any of these problems. Because while they're eating, we don't want to shoot anyway, so we can just wait till they're done eating and get the conversation. Well, we might be able to shoot. Um, should I just stick this in here? Yeah, that'd be great. We're hold, the hold the camera. Here, let me just go. Take the mic off. Well, I was thinking to keep it on, maybe. Oh, we're okay. Have and is it, yeah, I guess it's all right. Yeah. We don't want to lose her.